السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات ویلکم ٹو لیکچر نمبر فور برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور آئی واز ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ برانڈ فنڈامنٹلس ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر اینڈ آئی ہارڈلی کوڈ فنش دا فرسٹ فنڈامنٹل وین دا لیکچر کیم ٹو این اینڈ آئی وڈ دیئر فور پک اپ دا تھریڈس فرام ویئر اینڈ لیفٹ اینڈ ناؤ اسٹارٹ ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ فنڈامنٹل نمبر ٹو وچ از brand characteristics. Anyone in his layman's mind could might think that brand entity is a minor issue. Developing a brand may not be as serious as it may look. These are the kind of thoughts which non-marketing people or non-brand managers may conjure up in their mind. For the sake of argument, we might think to ourselves, Create a product, make it a little differentiated, package it well, price it right, and sales are guaranteed. Well, as the argument goes, it makes sense and uh, it looks like a pretty easy job, but that's not the way it is. We need to understand the whole process very comprehensively. Let me state that all brands, when introduced, start as kind of undifferentiated products on the marketplace and their differentiated features come to the surface only when brands are given meaning, when they make sense to their target market, and when they have made their mark, people start feeling the differentiated features in terms of attributes the brands carry and in terms of the benefits they make use of. Therefore, we can say that brands are acknowledged and recognized on the basis of their functionality. And on that basis, some brands become powerful and some do not become powerful. Some may become very powerful. Those that are powerful needs to be maintained and sustained. And those which are not powerful may go into oblivion, may disappear, or may remain kind of minor, small players on the market scene. Not really uh, disturbing other brands, not really uh, having the potential to make a dent into the sales of those which are very powerful. The powerful brands, like I said, are under everyone's scrutiny on the marketplace. And when I say everyone, I mean competitors. And those powerful brands remain under threat and continuously face challenges. And therefore, they are things which are very, very essential for the success of a company. And therefore, they need to be understood in all their subtleties and complexities. The subtleties and complexities are so important to the basic architecture of brand and brand management that McKinsey, one of the very well-renowned consultants in the world, have said that not everyone has the right to brand their products. For products to qualify as the branded products, there are three criteria according to those consultants. And these are all very important. Number one is that a brand must offer a superior value proposition. We have been talking about uh, superior value proposition. And we shall keep talking about this all along the course. This is one of the common denominators you will find as we go along the course. Second criterion is that a brand must deliver that superior value proposition. First, it should be able to offer. And second, it must be able to deliver that. And third criterion is that a brand must maintain a relationship with its customers. 
this can be uh, further explained. How does a brand maintain relationship with its customers? How does it keep itself alive? How does it survive and sustain itself? Toward that, we can say that brand management is a strategic process and it extends well beyond the limits of marketing department. All departments must get together in order to be able to offer the superior value proposition that I talked about. How do they do that? Marketing is as much an internal process as it is external. And internal marketing is very interactive, where you interact with your colleagues, with your peers, in other departments, but of course within your company. You've got to be able to convince them about the efficacy, the utility of the brand, the significance it plays, uh, it has um, toward creating value for the company, and in the process, having the potential to offer the same value to its customers. So you must be able to convince your peers and colleagues about the importance and significance of your brand, and they must be sold onto the concept. Once you know they are bought in, then they must be willing and they must be committed to delivering that value in consumer terms. How do they deliver that value in consumer terms? They do that, meaning the whole company, all the departments of which marketing is a part, without question. They do that by delivering superior technology, by delivering quality, by offering good price. Good price doesn't really mean it has to be very low, and it doesn't mean it has to be very high. It could be anywhere between the lowest possible and the highest possible range. And remember one thing, when it comes to pricing, in any given category, consumer consumables or consumer durables, uh, people or consumers in the target segment you're trying to reach have a very strong perception about the lower and the upper limits of the price. And therefore, your price has got to be within that range. If you are outside of that range, your target market is not going to accept that. If it is on a low side, meaning on a lower side, they might think that the product does not really fulfill the need or the product doesn't really satisfy them in terms of its appearance, in terms of the promise it carries. If it falls outside the range on the upper side, they may not be willing to buy it because they might think it is too expensive and it is not worth the price um, it carries. Apart from price, Delivering value on part of the company could also be improved distribution systems and all kinds of possible supports when it comes to logistics, for example. So the point here is that management of the company has got to be committed so that the superior value proposition that is offered by the brand could be delivered the way it is envisaged by the marketing department. Japtak आपके वो वाले कॉलीग्स और पीयर्स आपके साथ ही मुत्तफिक नहीं होंगे तब तक आप एक सुपीरियर वैल्यू प्रोपोजिशन डिलीवर शायद ना कर पाए हैविंग सेड दैट वी कैन आल्सो से दैट द कंपनी मस्ट बी सेंसिटिव टू ऑल द चेंजिंग नीड्स एंड प्रेफरेंसेस ऑफ योर कंज्यूमर्स व्हेनेवर यू थिंक द नीड्स हैव चेंज्ड बिकॉज़ इन रिस्पांस टू द मार्केट marketing dynamics, uh, they will keep changing. And uh, you've got to make sure that you are sensitive to those changes and preferences so that you can fulfill those changed needs. The brand must be able to adapt to changes and yet meaning the same in response to fierce competition. What does that mean? It means that you do not have to bring about 
radical changes in the brand architecture, the way it looks like, or the way it fulfills uh, needs of your consumers. You have to uh, bring about changes, but you also have to keep the brand or the character of the brand, the personality of the brand, the same as it was perceived yesterday, so that it is perceived the same way today, and it should be perceived tomorrow. This is how a brand maintains its relationship with the marketplace, that it remains a little dynamic in response to changing market forces, so that a relationship could be maintained. A further discussion on this, uh, how changes take place uh, in the market and uh, what kinds of responses uh, should be prepared uh, by the, the brand managers and how those responses are to be fulfilled in practical terms, in meaning in, in consumer terms, is going to be the topic of uh, later discussion under brand contract, uh, which will be uh, a you know, couple of lectures down the line. Now, having said that, uh, we can now discuss fundamental number three, which deals with layers of brands. Brands have so many layers, not always. I mean, a brand can be just one brand, and a brand can be a family of brands. A brand can have so many um, different levels. Why a brand has different levels and layers, um, this again is something which we shall be uh, talking in detail when we talk about brand extensions. But um, in order to have a very macro understanding uh, what kind of layers there could be uh, under one brand or under different brands, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today. What is important to understand is regarding layers and levels of brands, the situation under which you create those layers. Basically, you create different layers of brands in response to, like I said earlier, fierce competition. When competition makes life difficult in the marketplace and uh, brand managers really start scratching their heads, uh, what should be the response? Generally, the response is, okay, introduce one more brand. And by having another brand, we can satisfy another need or this very need in a changed way and thereby um, having an appeal for one more segment or a few more segments uh, and thereby in turn having um, an appeal uh, which goes across the segmental lines. Um, these are the kind of situations which brand managers have got to be sensitive to and they should be able to understand. And in response to those uh, um, changing situations or in response to uh, those um, uh, cropping situations, uh, they have to make their decisions. Now, let us talk about uh, the levels with which a brand could they may have um, in the market. We have different levels, like I said earlier, and uh, with the help of uh, this chart, you know, I can explain these one by one. First of all, uh, we may have what you call product brands. We can also call them standalone brands. Product brands relate to uh, different products, maybe within the same product line. For example, if a company has a line of detergents, it may have you know, three or four brands, and they're all different brand names. Brand X, Brand Y, Brand Z. Why that happens? We shall talk about that later. And this is what you call standalone brands. They're different entities. Uh, they may have identities which differ a little bit. As a matter of fact, you know, they should have you know, different identities. But the point is, they are within the same product line. The next, we have uh, what we call line brands. Line brands is that one brand name uh, represents one product line. If a company has, um, uh, again, uh, a line of detergents, for example, and the company has like four brands, all those friends, the four, I'm sorry, all those four brands will be brand X, 
and under that X, they might have in you know, a sub-brands. But the main brand which appears on the package and which is talked about or which is bought and which is sold, that is brand X. Line brand, when it comes to another line, which, for example, could be personal care products, different kinds of creams, you know, shave cream, could be cold cream, uh, could be anything relating to your personal uh, nurturing. Um, you can have another brand, say, with a brand Y and brand Z and so on and so forth. Then we have range brands. Now, range brands are not very different from line brands. Uh, when the range is a little bit broader, when you have you know, so many different lines, you can say okay, that we have a range of products or product lines and you can have different brand names given to that range or given to all the product lines which form that range. And then we have umbrella brands. Umbrella brands is a terminology which could be interchanged with range brands, meaning, um, you know, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, umbrella, let, let's put it this way, that umbrella brand is one brand. It is brand A. And under that umbrella, you have different lines. And those lines could be very diverse, meaning you have a product mix. You have detergents, you have toiletries, you have personal, other personal care products, you have uh, some eatables, line of food items. So whatever those are, they are under one umbrella, and that umbrella brand is one brand name. Uh, I can summarize it this way. Uh, that product brands and standalone brands, uh, which was the first category I discussed, are different from other three categories, which are um, line brands, range brands, and umbrella brands. The next category that we have, uh, or the, the, the next layer which we have, uh, could be company brand or family brand, as the name suggests. Uh, these brands are named after uh, the companies or after the families, uh, if a company happens to be a family business. And uh, you can very well guess that situations which necessitate uh, naming your products um, this way are those uh, where companies have a very good reputation and um, uh, the past history, uh, the very convincing and well-known uh, the history um, of branding and uh, delivering uh, value proposition to consumers. So uh, you, you, you like to uh, capitalize on the strength that you have uh, already in the marketplace and name your brands after your company name, like company X, brand X, company Y, brand Y. Then we have another category, which uh, is name brands. Now, this is a little tricky. A name brand is different from a brand name. Uh, the brand name could be, you know, uh, could be any name. It, 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 it can also be in the name brand. But when we say, or when we use the terminology name brand, it means it is named after someone. And that someone mostly is a designer. And this is what you see in terms of clothing nowadays, uh, cosmetics nowadays. Uh, there may be a few other items which I cannot think of at the moment, but uh, I leave that to your imagination. Well-known designers, when they become successful and well-known, like I said, like to carry the value into other lines of businesses. This is one of the properties or one of the strengths that we, which we discussed um, in one of the lectures early, that uh, strong and powerful brands have the potential to take business for one category to another, to another, and to another. Not only to other categories, but also to other regions of the world. So, successful designers uh, name their brands uh, after their names, and that's what you call name brands. I don't really have to name the designers. You can think of so many nowadays, uh, because all of you are users, in one way or the other, of uh, the designer goods. That completes our discussion on uh, layers of brands and um, in the hope that uh, we are clear about different layers, we now move on to the fourth fundamental, uh, which is um, 
a brand owner's commitment, uh, or in other words, with a management commitment. Owners of brands are not only brand managers. Owners of brands are all those who have stakes in the brands. And stakeholders are, you know, people uh, from within the company. They could be shareholders. They could be members of the trade also. And all those people who are associated with, with the company and uh, whose influence can matter when it uh, comes to making a difference between success and, you know, not success. I don't really want to use the word failure, but uh, with all those influencers, they're all stakeholders and um, they all own the brand and the brand must have total support of all those people. So we can sum it up this way that consistent dimensions, the right characteristics and the right layers are absolutely essential for brands to offer superior value to consumers. What really constitutes that superior value is a deep understanding, a deep understanding of consumers, meaning their needs, their behavior, their preferences, their biases, their experiences, so that that understanding could be shared by the top management and all the stakeholders, meaning all the brand owners, to make sure that the brand is a success in the market. In the absence of total support, the effort cannot be very fruitful for branding decisions. This is a statement to be underlined. This is to be underscored. There has to be total, total support for good branding decisions. The company must stay very committed to providing good quality as wanted by the consumers. Whenever we talk about quality, it means good quality. And good quality also is relative. When you talk of good quality in a certain category of automobiles, it may mean one thing. And while you talk about good quality relating another category, which is not that expensive, it means another. So that applies to all the categories and all the segments within the categories. The point here is that the brand owners and the management of the company must stay very committed to good quality that is provided to consumers. The companies must also provide differentiation. Nothing works more in the market than offering a point of difference. And I've been talking about this factor again and again, and I shall be talking about this factor again and again, because brand management is all about differentiation. One of the authors has said to the extent that it is the point of difference on which all the resources of the organization must converge. because the total resources of the organization are deployed to create that point of difference. And that's the point of difference which really matters in the market. That's the point of difference which brings you consumers. And that's the point of difference which keeps your consumers loyal to your brand. They come buy your brand over and over again, day in, day out, months, years, and years. The companies must stay very consistent in maintaining their brands and yet prepared for evolution. This is the same point which we discussed earlier also, that with the changing times, with the changing needs, the companies have got to stay very sensitive to fulfilling those needs in accordance with the changing needs. The companies must also support their brands through advertising, the market research, and improved distribution, support. Having said all that, this concludes our discussion on the four fundamentals of brand management, which I started talking about in the last lecture. And with that discussion, I would now like to move on 
to another topic of very high significance, um, which is brand value. Brand value is another topic, macro understanding about which has got to be developed in order to be able to put together all the building blocks of brand management so that when I start talking about the strategic brand management process in detail, component by component, you do not really have any problem understanding what I'm talking about. So for your benefit, on to the topic brand value. What is brand value? Brand value has two fundamental elements which you must remember. Yeah, itne ahem hain, do elements. Aap inko zehen nishin kar lijiye. One is that brands offer value to its consumers. And number two is brands generate value for their companies. Let us talk about brand value in terms of their consumers. The consumers, while using brands, must feel that they are getting full value for their money. This is kind of a slogan that you must have heard so many times. And this is uh, a phrase which so many companies use, and it is very, very common. What does that mean? That means that the money you spend on the brand, what you get in return should be full of value in terms of your satisfaction so that you feel the money that you've spent was worth spending. Customers must also feel that their decision to buy a brand has optimized their decision to buy the best brand. This has a psychological side. Whatever brand a consumer is using may not be the real best brand available on the market, but a consumer has got to have the feeling that his decision was right in buying the best brand. That's important. And that's the kind of feeling in which you must generate through creating the right identity of the brand which we discussed earlier so that the right image could be transmitted and the consumer thinks that he has made just about the best possible decision he could make to go for something which is the best on the market. And as a continuation of this kind of feeling, I can also say that consumers must get a confirmation. They must get a confirmation of the self-image they want to portray to others. Now, what is hidden is the psychological need which people want to have about the self-importance. This is why there are so many people like to think that they're different from others. Their image in their own eyes is so big that they think they are reinforcing that and further strengthening that by buying and using something which really has optimized their decision. If you go a step back, what I talked earlier, that a buyer must have the feeling that the decision to buy one particular brand has optimized his decision to buy the best brand, I can say a few words in support of this statement that the reason your friends and your peers keep su suggesting to you and rather keep advocating, why don't you use this brand? Why don't you buy it? For the simple reason that I bought it. If they're using a certain model of car, they would like to see to it that you also buy the same car. If they're using one particular brand of electronics, they would like to see to it that you also buy the same brand. And that is a reconfirmation of their decision that 
it was the most optimal decision to have gone for the brand I'm using. And I have talked about that, I've advocated that uh, to so many different friends, and they're all buying it. So this is how, you know, brands get more popular. And this is kind of a feeling which must be fulfilled by brands. Consumers must also get satisfaction out of the attractiveness of brands. And this relates to uh, the styling feature. We keep talking about uh, the brands being stylish or not being stylish and uh, whether buying a certain brand uh, because it is stylish and not buying a certain brand because it is not stylish. We even talk about the good quality of brand uh, but since, you know, it is not uh, the appealing in terms of its style or uh, in terms of the attractiveness it, it, it carries, uh, we either buy it or, or don't buy it. So this is a pretty straightforward feature uh, which, um, or a straightforward value which brands could must fulfill um, for their consumers. Uh, brands must also... Uh, generate another value for consumers, which is uh, very uh, different from uh, the ones kind of talked about. This is uh, kind of an intangible value. Uh, consumers must get the feeling that brands are uh, environmentally friendly. And this relates all those brands uh, which have the potential uh, to litter the environment. So many different examples can uh, be given uh, toward uh, expressing uh, this uh, the aspect. Uh, and I'm sure you, know, you must be having a lot of thoughts in your mind at this the very moment. Uh, let's talk about a product you know, which is being sold in a plastic bag and uh, all of a sudden the package is changed by the manufacturers and it comes in uh, a very attractive um, paper bag uh, which is very easy to dispose of. And uh, you feel very satisfied and happy about um, the, the new package style because uh, the first thing you know, which comes to your mind is that this company uh, is very um, ecology friendly. Uh, this company really cares about the environment and they are you know, making something uh, which can be easily disposed of and uh, it can be torn into pieces and properly uh, disposed of as part of the trash. Uh, another example could be in the area of automobiles, for example. Uh, it could be um, in, the, in the area of uh, uh, the motorbikes, uh, for example. Uh, what if uh, the manufacturers start telling you after carrying out uh, a very meaningful innovation which gives you know, their brand a very strong point of differentiation and that point is about low emission, meaning the burnt gases which your automobile or your bike is emitting in the shape of carbon monoxide or, or whatever they call it. Uh, the moment you find out or the moment you see this knowledge is imparted to you, remember we talked about that in the last lecture? The moment that knowledge is imparted that your bike, the one you're going to buy, emits a lesser amount of poisonous gases, you immediately think to yourself that company is really environmentally friendly and the brand really has a very, very tangible point of difference which attracts so many consumers to go buy that. So this is uh, one, of the, one of the feelings or one of the values rather which brands must satisfy for their consumers. Uh, having talked about the, the values, uh, different kinds of values which brands generate for their consumers, now let us talk about the uh, value with which brands that have the potential to generate for their companies. Well, in the first place, brands keep uh, strong brands. When I talk about brands, it, uh, I think it goes without saying that we are talking about a brand which is strong, which has a lot of value, and uh, which has a lot of, uh, you know, customer, which has a big customer basis. Having had an understanding how the brands create value for their consumers, let us now talk about the value brands generate for their companies. Well, in the first place, uh, it goes without saying, 
uh, the brands generate revenues and revenues lead to good cash earnings and profitability. And it is that profitability which creates um, a lot of power uh, for the brand in the first place and then for the company. Uh, brands generate uh, future demand um, with, with lasting uh, attractiveness uh, for consumers uh, in times to come. Brands keep competition at bay. If you have strong brands, you have a big customer base and very good following, and um, chances are that competitive brands are going to have a hard time either catching up with your sales or cutting into your sales, in other words. Uh, so brands, meaning powerful brands, create and erect barriers for competition. Brands carry value into other areas, the meaning brands have the potential to carry their company into other markets. And those markets could be the part of your country and those markets could be the part of uh, the world. You can go international if the brand is strong enough. It may carry you into different regions. Uh, brands also offer value to the companies to go into other product categories. If your brand in one category is very strong, you feel tempted to offer the same brand into other lines. And therefore, what you can do is you can generate for the company economies of scale in terms of all the variables of marketing mix. One concept that we talked about, I think, in the very first or maybe the second lecture. When you have uh, the same brand, which cuts across different segments and which cuts across different categories, the amount of advertising, the amount of total communication that you carry out is much more economical um, in comparison with what it would have been if you had different brands for different lines. So that's what I mean by economies of scale um, in terms of the variables of marketing mix. I've just given you one example. Now, having understood how brands create value for the consumers and how they generate value for the companies, uh, we must not lose sight of one factor, and that is that brands also generate value for themselves. Because unless they generate value for themselves, they cannot offer the value to their two beneficiaries, uh, who are consumers and the companies. The question is, how brands create value for themselves? Well, it is through commitment of brand managers. We are back to the same factor which we talked earlier. Commitment by management is a very, very significant factor to give meaning to brands so that they become powerful. And if they are powerful, they have value. And if they have value to themselves, they certainly will offer value to consumers and they will offer value to their companies. Let us try to understand this concept by way of a value interface which is uh, graphically illustrated uh, right there. You can see these three circles. At the very bottom we have the blue circle which says the management commitment. And this is the, the factor with which I talked last that the brand management has to give meaning to uh, the brand so that it can create value for itself to be able to offer value to its two beneficiaries because if the brand doesn't have value to itself, it cannot offer anything. And when it has a lot of value, when it has the value base, it offers value to consumers, which you can see in, in the circle on the right-hand side, yellow color, and it offers values to the company on the left. And these three circles, which is obvious from the illustration, have an interface. And this is the interface which is important to understand. It is an interaction which takes place continuously 
perennially as long as the brand exists, in the hope that this is now very clear to all of us. Let us now, let us now summarize by saying that managements that are committed to maintaining and adding value to the brands never take their eyes off that strategic goal. They are so committed and they're so focused on that that they're glued to it. And when you have something in that sharp a focus, you never lose sight of anything which requires your attention. There are many brands which you might think of in the national market and also on the international market which have a tremendous level of longevity. Now, longevity relates to the number of years or the age of the brands. There are brands that have been around for decades and there are brands in the international market which have been around for more than a century now. I mean, this is no exaggeration, but that's the way it is. The question is, how do they maintain this kind of longevity? This is not an accident. It happens through a program that we started talking about in the very first lecture and which, of course, is the starting point of the brand management process. You give meaning, meaning to the product and you keep on doing that. You, your effort spans over years and then decades and decades turn into a century. Can you imagine those kind of brands? If we are dealing with a brand, maybe we do not have the objective to take that brand into the next century, but we should have the objective to sustain that brand for a long time to come. And in order to be able to do that so that the brand remains valuable, like I said earlier, we've got to be very sensitive to changes that keep taking place in the marketplace, which is very dynamic. So the longevity of brands is a result of relentless efforts over the years and decades. This is the way we can summarize. Now, the next question is, how do companies maintain value of brands in a way that brands create for themselves the kind of longevity I'm talking about? That happens through two different modes. One is by investing into manufacturing, and the other is by investing into the market. When we talk about investment into manufacturing, we are talking about basically improvement of product quality. And that means investment into new technologies, investment into new plants, new machines, new equipment, so on and so forth. And if you uh, look at it very carefully, it is uh, a big area which we are talking about. And uh, this is uh, that part of the uh, strategic for the management and that part of the strategic vision which we shall be uh, talking about later when we start talking about different components of brand management one by one. Investment into marketing. What does that mean? I'll leave it to your imagination for a, for a while. Let me now state. Investment into markets essentially means advertising and all the communication campaigns, promotions, everything that goes on into the marketplace in order to communicate with the consumers what the brand is all about and the benefits, the features, the attributes uh, the brand carries okay, because you want to convey to them uh, the value which the brand carries for them so that they can conjure up uh, the right image or if they already have the right image, which they should have, they can reinforce that. So this investment is an investment which uh, is uh, carried out from time to time. Uh, while 
you, you will be working in the companies, you will hear this thing from time to time, people talking about the need for kicking off another campaign. Uh, the managers do talk, uh, you know, every now and then. Now is the time that we should start talking about the brand all over again because uh, this silence, I think, has been um, for too long. And uh, in order to give consumers a reminder that we do exist, not only that we do exist, but we exist in a very vibrant way, let us start talking with them uh, once again um, so that we can create, um, you know, a lot of noise, so to say, uh, to keep competition at bay, to the reinforcing you know, of whatever the brand carries and uh, whatever you say I've talked about. Um, investment into marketing can also mean improving distribution systems. Uh, distribution systems are one of the lifelines of uh, the overall marketing. And improvement relating distribution uh, is something that I touched upon earlier also. It could be, you know, wider coverage. It could be making your coverage more intensive, meaning wherever you are, you want to uh, be there um, in, in, in a more mm, intense way. And it could be extensive, which means that you really want to expand and uh, you want to cover a larger area. So investment um, into distribution means that you have to go to the markets, which you want to improve. Uh, you have to talk with uh, the existing distributors in terms of bringing about uh, the strengths which you envision and which you envisage. And in doing so, maybe you have to train them uh, from, from certain points of view. Maybe you have to train their sales force from certain standpoints, and which essentially means that you are investing because all those efforts means money. Uh, the more companies invest into brands, the more powerful the brands become and better leadership roles and positions they attain in the market. We can relate this with the findings of the PIMS study, which I talked about in one of my earlier lectures. You remember I talked about the differential between the two brands in terms of the returns both of those bring to their companies. I'm the brand, which is the market leader, having a market share of like, you know, 40% may bring to its company uh, a return, which is three times as much as that of the other brand bringing to its company. And it is because of that differential that companies strive so hard and they invest so much money into making their brands more and more valuable and more and more powerful. It is precisely for that reason that companies are willing to pay prices for brands much higher than their market value. Remember this point we talked about in the very first lecture? That in the new era of brand management, companies are running after strong brands and acquisitions taking place only for the purpose of owning powerful and valuable brands because the companies know that powerful brands are going to solve many of their financial problems. So having talked about that, I can, I think, state, if you think of the whole thing that we have talked about, your thinking will fall into a very proper perspective in terms of the brand value. And with that, I would like to wind up today's lecture, and before I wind up, I'll give you the recap. We started talking about the brand fundamentals, which we continued from the previous lecture number three. And after completing our discussion of brand fundamentals, we started talking about um, a brand value. And brand value with being a topic of very high significance uh, we have devoted quite a bit of time on how the brands generate value for consumers and how they create value for the companies. And uh, once they become powerful and valuable, why companies run after 
uh, strong brands uh, in order to own them. Um, wrapping up this uh, discussion, I also would like to add that in the next lecture, I would like to talk about brand challenges because I did point out this factor earlier that no matter however powerful the brands may be, they are not immune from attacks. Um, they are under uh, attacks. Uh, the competitive onslaught um, carries on all the time and uh, brands face a lot of challenges and threats. The, what those challenges are, what those threats are, and how they emanate, uh, what are the sources from where they stem. We shall talk about that in the next lecture. I will look forward to talking with you and for the office.